Good evening, Fremont Community Church. As always, such a pleasure to be with you this morning. I guess it's not morning, it's evening. I don't know why I said morning, maybe because I say that at church all the time. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, we're here, and we're glad to be here. I'm glad to be here anyway. I'm excited to be going back and diving back into the book of James, chapter 1, this evening. Um, it's going to be good. So let's uh, let's do that. Uh, but first, let's pray, and then uh, and then we'll go there. Beautiful, wonderful, glorious, gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for your presence. Lord, you are with us. Father, I ask that as we open up your Word, that you would speak wisdom to us, that you would speak life to us. That the message of truth would bring new life to human hearts tonight. In Jesus' beautiful name, amen and amen. Just a reminder, friends, uh, we didn't, uh, we talked about this last time, but just a reminder, uh, next week, obviously not this week because that's today, but next week, we won't be meeting at 7.30 on Wednesday night. We'll be meeting at 7.30 on Tuesday night from now on. Um, so that, that's the plan. So, um, starting next week, so that would be September 5th, September 5th, we will be, uh, 7.30 Tuesday nights, uh, and then, um, and then we'll, we'll, um, continue forward. Uh, yeah, okay, so thank you for... Uh, paying attention to to that. Um, uh, let's see. I'm getting lots of text messages from my wife, so let me just respond quickly, and, <laughs> and then I won't be distracted. Okay. So, <laughs> all right, so let's go to James chapter one. Last time we ended at, uh, we ended at verse 12. A man who endures trials is blessed because when he passes the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. That, that, was, that was where we ended last time. So we are going to continue on. This is James chapter one. Uh, from the Holman Christian Standard Bible, or the HCSB. And uh, let's, uh, let's read James 1, 13. No one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God. For God is not tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own eager evil desires. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dearly beloved brothers. Every generous act and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. With him there is no variation or shadow cast by turning. By his own choice, he gave us new birth by the message of truth, so that we would be the firstborn of his creatures, first fruits, sorry, of his creatures. My dearly loved brothers, understand this. Everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For man's anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and evil, humbly receive the implanted word, which is able to save you. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and preserves in it, and is not forgetful hearer, but one who does good works, the person will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, then his religion is useless and he deceives himself. Pure and undefiled religion before God and before our God and Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. 
Thank you, Lord, for your word. There's a lot here. Again, James kind of talks like the Proverbs. So it's, you know, we can really break these up and uh, not necessarily huge overarching themes involved. Uh, it's pretty simple to, to just, we just attack each phrase as it comes because they're not necessarily connected to each other um, in one train of thought. Um, so we just finished talking about trials and the dif and the difficulties that people walk through. Uh, so now he's going to move on and begin to speak about some other things, but uh, but he he stops before he gets there and he gives us this verse, verse thirteen. No one undergoing a trial should say, "I am being tempted by God," for God is not tempted by evil, and He Himself doesn't tempt anyone. Uh, this verse is so key to, to the theology of suffering that has developed in my heart over the past few years. Um, and I don't know how much I've talked about this, but, you know, I grew up in a Pentecostal church, a great church that taught the Bible and that loved Jesus. But, and uh, there was this implicit understanding in our congregation, even if it was never spoken from the pulpit, and I don't think it was, um, but it existed, in my mind at least, that, uh, that if we were obedient followers of Jesus, that we would be able to avoid suffering, that suffering was, was an aberration, it's something that happened, but it didn't, um, but, but. But, um, you know, not to us. We're blessed, right? We're, we're righteous. God's blessed us. So we're never going to experience anything difficult. Um, that isn't true. And I didn't understand that. And so um, as I've grown older, and especially in the last few years, uh, which has been marked by so much suffering, both in my personal life, but also all around us with with you know, a pandemic and difficult economy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I've had to reevaluate the way that I, that I see and experience and understand suffering. I, um, suffering is something that is going to come to every Christian life. The Bible's quite clear on that. Jesus is quite clear on that. Into every life, a little rain must fall. That's, that is the way it goes to believe that we're going to be able to go through life and not experience difficulty and suffering um, is, is foolishness. We are, we are, everyone is going to experience suffering, but what do we do with it? What do, how do we respond to it? Uh, what, what is going on? And there's different ideas that kind of float out there about this, about this topic of suffering. Um, there's, there, uh, but where I've landed, I don't, I'm not going to explore those other ideas, but where I've landed, my, my New Testament understanding of suffering um, says that number, number one, we will all go through suffering. Number two, God doesn't send suffering to us. Number three, God is always with us in the suffering, and number four, God promises that our suffering is not for nothing, that our, that, that our suffering will be used in our lives to, uh, to, to bring about our growth and joy and his glory as we walk through suffering. Um, and that first, uh, that, well, it's, I guess the second one, the second point of that. So first one is everyone's going to suffer. Point two is God does not send suffering. Um, this verse, no one undergoing a trial should say, I am being tempted by God. This verse is one of the key verses for that. There's many verses that kind of key into this idea, but this one is very key. And James is being absolutely serious here when he says, don't, don't tell me that God sent your suffering. That's not how this works. God doesn't tempt people. God doesn't do that. That's when you're in a trial, don't say, oh, God is testing me. No, that's not how it works. That's not how this operates. God doesn't send evil to anyone. 
but uh, he will use it. But we'll we'll, we'll get there in a minute. <laughs> but uh, but um, we shouldn't blame God. And there's always uh, there's always this this uh, uh, tendency in our hearts to get angry with God when things go wrong in our lives, especially if we're people, if you are one, or if you, like me, are a person who's trying to live your life um, in order to please the Lord, you know, I'm living my life as unto God, so why should I experience suffering, <laughs> right? I'm a good boy, I am, right? So that's that's the, you know, so we think, well, I, I shouldn't experience suffering. God's in charge of everything. God's in control, which I don't even like that phrase, but we don't have time for that conversation. Um, why would those of us who are really attempting to pursue God and to do what God wants us to do, why should we experience suffering? And, and when we do, it really reveals what our theology of suffering actually is. Because if we believe that, if we believe that if I'm a good boy, no bad things are going to happen to me, um, that I'm one of God's favorites and so no bad things are going to happen to me, and then bad things happen, if that if we get angry with God in those moments, and we kind of point the finger at him and we say, hey, you were supposed to keep me safe, right? Um, you were supposed to make sure this kind of thing never happened to me. Ooh. Uh, um, what, what is revealed in that moment is that this was a quid pro quo kind of situation with you and God that that you were like I'll serve you if you protect me right and also that we really believed which this is kind of a salvation by works kind of thing isn't it that that I'm going to be safe because I'm doing a b c d e correctly um and that's just not that's just not right. That's just not biblical. That's not that's not how this all works, you know. Um, that's not the way that we that, that we walk through the world. We are we live in a broken world, and suffering is going to come. Temptation is going to come. But when we go through those these moments, we shouldn't point at God in anger and accusation and frustration, saying, "You did this to me." No. Uh, we live in a broken, broken world. And so bad things are going to happen. We are going to be tempted. And we are not perfect beings. We are going to walk through temptation. We're so often angry with God about the trials we go through. We blame him, we accuse him, but he doesn't send them. He will be with us in the midst of them, he will make sure that something good comes from them. Even if it's a good that we never see until after we die, we will receive reward for walking through difficult time of one form or another, whether it's just our, our whether the, if it's our character is transformed or that there's, you know, I don't know how it all works, but that's the promise. This is not in vain. It's not for nothing. We will see, we, we will be blessed in the midst of it. Um, we can't blame God for what happened. So verse 14, each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Okay, so we have some work to do on this passage. Uh, one of them one of the things we need to talk about is the bad translation that happened here. Uh, there, here in verse 13, um, or 14, in the Holman Christian Standard Bible, which I hear is a good Bible. But this word here, uh, evil, that's not in there. Um, that's not in the Greek, and it's really important that we understand that it's not in the Greek. Um, so it goes, the, the verse in, uh, in this translation says, Each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. Okay, the word evil is not in the text. Um, this is one of the reasons why we need to get used to trying to connect 
with the texts because uh, evil is inferred, but it is not stated. Now, why do I? What, what do I mean by that? What I mean is, uh, it wouldn't be temptation if it wasn't an evil desire. Does that make sense? But it's really important that we understand that the word evil is not there. Okay? Because uh, uh, desire in and of itself is not sinful. Okay? We have lots of desires. John Piper says the human heart is a desire factory. We have lots of desires. We are a beings that are full of desire. Desire is not evil in and of itself. Um, it is entirely okay for us to be people who have desires. Uh, there's a great book called The Seven Desires of the Human Heart, uh, which talk about the thing, you know, the desires that God created us with that are actually meant to draw us toward him. Um, things like a desire to be great, a desire to be beautiful, a desire to be loved, a desire to be uh, a, a desire to to uh, live without shame. Um, all of those are desires God's put in our hearts, and all of those desires are meant to draw us in to relationship with God. And those are all fine. And the desires that exist inside of us are not in and of themselves evil. There's nothing wrong with those desires. But the word that is here, the word evil is not there. But the word desire in the Greek that's here is, uh, it's like desire turned up to 11. Okay, So it's strong or passionate desire or lust. Okay, um, So it is desire that is, that is just amped up, cranked up to its highest peak. So you might say, instead of evil desires, by his own passionate desire. So this is a desire that exists on the inside of us, which is fiery and out of our own control. That's okay. Well, that kind of desire is an issue. That kind of desire uh, uh, can cause problems. Again, nothing wrong with the desire itself. But when we are drawn away and enticed, and I love these, the, I looked at these two words in the Greek also, the drawn away and the enticed, those two words. And, and both of them are like fishing terms. Um, uh, so imagine imagine a, a fish hook with a, with a bait with bait on it that's, that's drawing the fish away and drawing the fish towards towards the hook. Come here, little fish. You know, that that's there and they're being drawn towards this bait, drawn towards that hook. And then the boom, they hit it and oh, now they're hooked. My favorite SpongeBob episode is the hooks episode. It's really, really great. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, we have this passionate desire that exists inside of us. And then something comes into our attention. Something passes by our attention comes into our sphere of, of, of experience that promises to fulfill that desire and we begin to pursue it. That's the picture. The picture isn't of nefarious evil desires, you know. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is, it's just desire that exists in us. But then bait comes along. <laughs> that is, that, that, that is, Enticing us to fulfill that desire in a way that is contrary to how God designed that desire to be fulfilled. A foolish way of, of meeting that desire that exists inside of us. So the bait comes by and we are drawn towards it. Okay, After desire has conceived, so once that has happened, ooh, that smells good. Kind of reminds me of like, do you remember cartoons where, um, I, I, and I, I can't think of any specific episodes, but I just remember, you know, the like like um, cartoons where the smell of the cheese from the mousetrap, you can see it like like in like a gas like floating through the thing, and then it it lands on the mouse's nose, and then he smells it, and all of a sudden he's like 
lifted off his feet and just drawn towards, you know, kind of, kind of, uh, levitated towards this cheese that's in the trap, right? Um, I think Tom and Jerry probably had a scene like that, and I'm I'm sure there were other, you know, it's definitely something that used to happen in the cartoons, where uh, they would just be drawn towards this desire, but it was leading them into danger. It's that kind of a picture. That's what happens, and as soon as as soon as we respond. To the bait. Desire has conceived and gives birth to sin. It gives birth to sin. And I want to talk about sin for a minute. First of all, you need to understand that tem being tempted is also not a sin. Temptation is not a sin. Jesus himself was tempted. It's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to give way to that temptation and to do something that we shouldn't have done. A sin is a fascinating word, um, and there's a whole lot we could we could do with that. Uh, this one in particular is hamartia, which means to miss the mark. Um, really important that we pay attention to that. And by the way, the mark we're aiming for is love. Okay, so so sin. This word gives birth to hamartia. That's, that's the Greek word, hamartia. And it means to miss the mark. Um, so imagine a, uh, imagine a target, and I shoot, and I don't hit the bullseye. That's hamartia. I missed. I missed what I was aiming at. The big question needs to be, what am I aiming at? And the answer is I'm aiming at love. I want to behave in a loving way. I want to be loving in what I'm doing. That's that's the bullseye. And when my behavior is loving, boom, that hits the bullseye. And I used to tell my youth group kids back in the day that kind of the guide rails we always want that, that should guard all of our behavior. And the question we should ask of all of our behavior is, is it wise and is it loving? Um, is it wise and is it loving? Because sometimes it can be loving, but not very wise. And sometimes it can be wise, but not very loving. Uh, we want it. We want it to be in between those two guardrails. That's the mark. We want to hit that mark. Right there, you know, Robin Hood. Right there, in the in the in the in the bullseye. That's that's our goal. And Jesus hit that bullseye every time, uh, but we miss it. And sometimes it is this bait that causes us to miss it. Causes us. To, to, to get off of the track of doing something in a loving way, in a wise way. And it says, when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Now, here's the thing we need to reckon with, okay? I love that he says, when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Because, you know, I think sometimes we think... Uh, like, as soon as we do something wrong, boom, the whole, you know, it, the whole world's going to explode. And then, so, and, and, and we're going to be caught and, and the whole, and we're going to, you know, death. Oh, no. Oh, no. I mean, uh, but then we do something wrong and nothing happens. We do something wrong and we get away with it. Well, yeah, that's because sin isn't fully grown yet. Sin, it isn't. An individual sin that's going to kill you, even though individual sins are really, really dangerous, it's the pattern that's developing in you. Because the first time that you gave way to a desire that wanted to be fulfilled in an ungodly way, that was a big choice to make. But the second time it was a little easier, and the third time it was even a little easier, and then finally it becomes, this is just who I am, this is what I do, I don't even think about it very much, I just, this is how I work. And then eventually that pattern leads to destruction in our lives, to death. Um, sin steals from us in all of the ways that sin steals from us. It steals from us in destroying relationships. Patterns of sin destroy our relationships. Where, uh, you know, I, I spoke to a man that I highly respected, and he ended up getting prosecuted for, uh, for he, he molested a child. 
which I couldn't believe it when I heard it. And um, he told me it started with, it started with, you know, he looked at pornography a little bit, and then it went to child pornography, and then it went to actually molesting a, a, a child. And, you know, it went from something, what a seemingly harmless sin, something that is just me, nobody else knows that I'm doing this, and so, you know, it can't really hurt anybody until it actually does, and it destroyed his marriage, and it destroyed his family, and it destroyed his his work. He His whole life was just undone by this pattern of sin, which began with the very first time he decided to look at something and he knew he shouldn't, all the way. And that pattern grew and grew and grew until it broke open his entire life. And... Um, That's how sin works. Sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. Uh, death in all of the areas of our life. And we that's why we have to nip it in the bud, as Barney Fife so wisely said. We've got to stop it before it reaches the place where it has the power to destroy us. We have to deal with it early. We have to deal with it at the temptation stage and say no. Or if we do stumble and we make a mistake, we, we recognize it immediately and we turn aside from it and we don't make that mistake again. We come back to the Lord and we say, I made a mistake, please forgive me and help me not to make that choice again. This is so radically important because sin is so destructive and powerful. And I want you to hear me. Jesus forgives sin, even the greatest and the worst of sins. Even the child molester can be forgiven for the sins that they have committed. That's the truth. And not only that, but Jesus will work to help restore that which sin has broken and destroyed. You may not ever get some things back. Some things have died and you won't get them back. But God will work with you to restore to life the things that the enemy has stolen from you. That's the glory of the love of God. That's the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That though sin is as destructive as it is, Jesus comes in and removes the power of sin from our lives. And he undoes what sin has done. And he gives us back our lives. That's the power of resurrection that's at work in us even now. So let go of that stuff and let Jesus restore you, return you to who you were meant to be. Sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. Verse 16. Don't be deceived, my dearly loved brothers. Every generous act and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. I love this verse. It's very poetic. Uh, and, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a sucker for that kind of thing. Um, but I also love this beautiful truth that all of the good things that exist in our lives are a gift from God. That's true. All of the good things that exist in our lives are a gift from God. Why does he say that here? Because you are full of desires, right? You and I were full of desires, and God gave you those desires. They're not meant to destroy us. Those desires destroy us only when we don't pursue them as the gifts from God that they are. That we don't Honor God with those desires. The desires we've been given are gifts that come from him and they're beautiful and they're perfect and they're wonderful. But if we, if we pursue the desires in and of themselves, then they will ruin us and destroy us. But if we pursue God, he will fulfill these desires for us. It's like Jesus says, you know, uh, uh, don't worry about what you'll eat. Don't worry about what you'll wear. Don't worry about those things. Uh, seek first the kingdom and its righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. Jesus is saying God is the one we pursue and he will give us, he will fulfill the desires that we have as we pursue him. He will 
give us the companionship that we need. He will make sure that we have enough to eat, enough to wear, enough to, to, to get through life, he'll take care of us in those ways. He will fulfill all the desires that we have. He'll provide us with a holy marriage, uh, so that we have, you know, the the the, the all all of those things. Oh, you know, I, I do want to. Can I backtrack just a hair? Their singleness is holy. Can I say that? Um, so often we want, we really, <laughs> we kind of paint the fairy tale picture of the, the, the romance that we've always wanted to have in our lives. And, and we're excited about that fairy tale picture. And, 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 and many of us will live out that kind of life. You know, we're going to get married. We're going to have wives or husbands and children and, and family and, and, and but for some of us, singleness is the calling. We've been called to live out a life of singleness, um, a life where where romance isn't isn't a part of it, and where we're going to be we're going to be a people who are who who are just preserved for God outside of a, a romantic relationship um, for the rest of our lives. And I want you to know. That's okay. That's beautiful. That's holy. In fact, Paul encouraged people to stay single if they could. He was like, singleness is better. You just, you know, all of that, all of that romance stuff, that's just a, man, that's a big drain on the energy. Uh, and that's, that's energy you can't give to God. So, so uh, uh, if you can stay single, you should. And I remember as a teenager saying, don't think I can stay single, Paul. <laughs> but, uh, and that's probably true. Um, otherwise, God wouldn't have given me my wife. Um, but uh, uh, the point here is pursuing God is, is, is the point of the human life. And he will give us all of the gifts. He will give us the things that we truly need. He will give us what we need. So that's, that's one piece. But the other piece is the, op like the negative of that, which is... Um, we cannot receive the perfect gifts that God has for us by running after them in a human manner. We cannot receive the perfect gifts that the Father of Lights wants to give us. We can't receive those by pursuing them in a fleshly, human way that is birthed of, uh, of the whole desire and debate situation. That's never going to lead us to God's perfection. Uh, that's never going to lead us to the to the kind of satisfaction of our desires that God ordained for us. For running after the desires for the sake of sa satiating those desires, we will never find the perfect that God has for us. But if we're pursuing God, we can trust Him to meet our needs. I hope that makes sense. Um, uh, James says. With him there is no variation or shadow cast by turning. He's quoting a psalm there. Um, oh, maybe it's Malachi 3.6. Uh, anyway, God doesn't change. God doesn't change. God doesn't change. That's really good news. That's such good news. He's not fickle. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't swerve here and there. God doesn't change. God stays the same all the time. He doesn't variate. He doesn't, uh, is that a word, variate? He doesn't, he does, I think uh, it's variegate. I don't know. He doesn't change. He doesn't vary. He doesn't, he doesn't shift from one thing to another. He doesn't cast a shadow of turning like on a, like on a sundial. That's not who God is. God remains the same all the time. And if he met the needs of the ones who went before us, he will meet our needs today. If he met the needs of those that we know their testimonies, he will meet your needs. This is who he is. And he's always giving good and perfect gifts. He does not change. And he does not change 
by his own choice, verse 18, he gave us new birth by the message of truth. So I love this because it's being contrasted here. The message of truth is giving us new birth, new life, new, uh, new hope, new joy. The message of truth gives us that kind of birth. But sin, when conceived, when fully grown, gives birth to death. So the message of truth gives us gives birth to new life in us but sin when it's fully grown gives birth to death that contrast is so beautiful and it was by god's own choice it was his desire his design his purpose to give you new birth by the gospel of jesus christ he decided to do it uh, so often we slip into this understand this kind of feeling some uh that that like jesus is nice but god the father is kind of mean and grumpy right uh but if we'd ever if we read john three sixteen, we would know that that god so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son okay this whole plan of salvation this whole plan of forgiveness all of this has been in God's heart and has been in his plans and his designs and desires for you since before the foundations of the earth. He has set his love upon you. He loves you. And he has been working since then to bring beautiful gifts into your life. So don't pursue all these all these you know, flashy gifts that go flying around saying, hey, just leave God's way behind and come follow me because uh, you'll be more satisfied here. Isn't that what happened in the Garden of Eden? God created Adam and Eve. He was leading them towards the fulfillment of who they were. And then all of a sudden, here comes the snake saying, hey, God doesn't really want to give you uh, all that stuff that you want. So come and follow me, and I will give you that, right? He says, God doesn't want you to be like him. He, do, he, he doesn't want that for you. That's why you're not allowed to eat that fruit. But if you just eat that fruit, you'll have everything your little heart desires. And Eve believed him, and Adam followed suit. Oh, my gosh, and now look where we are. If we would have just trusted in the one who gave us all the good and perfect gifts we already have, we would never have been tempted to walk away and to pursue things outside of what God has already chosen to give us. Temptation, uh, the best way to battle temptation is with the power of greater pleasure. What do I mean by that? The power of greater pleasure is the deep and abiding understanding that the things that God has for me are better than the things that the world or Satan has for me. The things that God has for me are better than the things that the world or Satan has for me. And when I trust that what God wants for me is truly better, truly sweeter, truly more beautiful, truly more lasting and, and real, than any of the things that the world might offer me. When I believe that, it's not hard to say no to the devil. It's easy. Because when you understand what he is offering you is a shiny piece of garbage, then you're not going to want it. Our desires won't be tricked into following after these false things, which are only going to steal from us, only going to kill us, only going to lead us to death. God is the gift, the giver of perfect gifts. Not the world, not the enemy, God. And when we understand that, we will, we will live free from the power of temptation. And he did that so that we would be the first fruits of his creation. Okay? So we became, we were given new birth by the gospel, the message of truth so that we would be the first fruits of his creation. What does that mean, that we would be the first fruits of his creation? Well, that's what we are, friends. You and I are the first in all of creation to have the power of resurrection moving 
within us. I've talked about this before in so many different ways. But I remember the first time that I really came to understand that with Jesus' resurrection began a chain reaction that was going to engulf the whole of the universe in resurrection. The future of the universe is to be pushed through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ so that on the other end, sin and death will no longer exist in the universe. Sin and death will have been purged from the universe. We will have moved through it and beyond it because of the resurrection of Jesus. And that the little spark that Jesus, that began with Jesus, will cause this chain reaction to move outward through all of creation so that when God's finished, all things will be made new. That's the promise of the scripture. That's the promise of the gospel. That by the time God is done with this, he will be all in all. And all things will be made new. That's the finish line. That's, that's where we're, we're all headed. But all that's connected with sin is going to burn away and be gone and pass away. It is, belongs to the, to the old age, the age we no longer belong to. We belong to the next age. But resurrection power has not begun its work in the regular, you know, uh, th that was me knocking on my wall, uh, the regular, uh, uh, you know, matter of this world. The, the you know, the, 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 the tangible stuff has not begun to be resurrected yet. Well, I mean, it has because Jesus' body was resurrected. But Jesus was only the first. And through Jesus' resurrection, all other things will be resurrected, including those of us who are trusting in him. And those of us that are currently trusting in him right now, that same resurrection power that existed in Christ is already at work in you and me right now. And we are the first fruits. The first fruits was uh, when, when they would plant a field and, and, and the, first, the first little shoots of, uh, of wheat that would come up and have, you know, the little heads on them, they would cut those off and they would offer them to the Lord. That was the tithe, the first fruit that they would offer to the Lord. Thank you for this, God. I'm giving it to you because I know you're going to bring in the rest. And that's who we are. We, the church, are the first fruits of the rest of creation. We are the sign of... Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 8. We are the sign to the rest of creation that death will not rule and reign in them forever. That death is being undone. I love it in, in uh, I, and I quote this all the time, I know, but I just love it anyway, uh, from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis, where uh, Aslan says that when an innocent victim gives his life for a traitor, that, 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 the, the stone table, which is the law, will break and even death itself will begin to move backwards. Um, that's the truth. The, the, Jesus changed the rules of the universe, but we haven't yet seen it with our eyes, but we will. And the activity of the Holy Spirit inside of us now is the evidence that the rest is coming. Um, I can't tell. Uh, oh, man. It, it, just thinking about this. This is the good news of the gospel, that God is recreating all things and that what sin and death have wrought in the universe is being undone forever and ever. And we can believe that here and now and be part of what's going on here and now in a way that we can partner with it. We can be agents of recreation everywhere in the universe, hallelujah, that the power of sin would be undone by the glory of the power of life that has flown through Jesus' empty tomb, hallelujah. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little excited now. <laughs> oh, I love it. This is what God wanted to do, and this is what he is doing. And if we can just trust him, we will see it at work in us. Okay, wow, we, uh, um, yeah, we're running out of time. Verse 19, 
I don't want to leave that because I just it's my, just one of my favorite things. Verse 19, my dearly loved brothers, understand this. Okay, one quick note. Back to, I can't leave it alone. But as soon as I said chain reaction, I thought of the movie Oppenheimer. And there's the thing, in, the thing, and it was this big movie that was out. But there's, there's this idea that they had when they built the first atomic bomb that it was possible that when they set that atomic bomb off that the chain reaction wouldn't stop and that it would continue out and, and actually set the entire atmosphere on fire and kill everyone. <laughs> they said there was a non-zero probability. It was really, really, really small, but it was less than zero, or more than zero, I should say, that it might happen. And so uh, <laughs> I just, uh, I, that just reminds me of Jesus because he did. He set the atmosphere on fire. He set the universe on fire with the fires of resurrection. Praise the Lord. Okay, next. Uh, my dearly loved brothers, understand this. Everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. <sighs> My dearly loved brothers, understand this. Everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. I'm going to read it one more time. My dearly loved brothers, understand this. Everyone must be quick to hear slow to speak, and slow to anger. I'm moved by this because I think I think, what would it be like? What would it be like if we all took this advice? <clears throat> what would it be like? You and I and the United States of America need to hear this instruction. What would it be like if we all followed this advice? Quick to hear. It means quick to listen. That I'm going to, you know, have you ever heard that you have two ears and one mouth, so you should listen twice as much as you speak? What, what if that was real? What if we could do that? What, what if we all took that attitude on? That we listened much more than we spoke. And that we made our anger wait on the back burner. How much would that mean? How much would that change the world? It would radically change social media. That much I know. What would it be like? What would politics be like? <laughs> if we listened more than we spoke. What would friendships be like? if we listened more than we spoke? What would marriage be like if we were always slow to anger? If we made it really hard to make us angry? For man's anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. I use this verse recently in our one of our sermons about emotional health. You know, our emotions are, they have important purposes in our lives. We were created as emotional beings. Um, but anger 
uh, anger isn't it isn't the road to righteousness. Sometimes we think it is. Sometimes we love we love righteous anger. We love to be righteously indignant. Um, you know, there's this whole there's this idea out in the world now of manufactured outrage, which is like things that are written and created specifically to tick people off. Why? Because you're more likely to click on it if it makes you angry. And advertisers know this. So they create things specifically to anger you because they want you to see their products. The algorithms of Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and TikTok and you name it are all built to find the things that make you angry and make you feel righteous. That make you angry and that make you feel righteous. Because they know that you and I will go there every time. But James says your anger does not make you righteous. Your anger cannot accomplish righteousness. Whoa. Your anger cannot accomplish righteousness. Man, these two verses, just these two verses, James 1, 19, and 20, that needs to just come up every time anybody goes on Facebook. Just <laughs> quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Let's just put that out there. Let's just shove it into the eyeballs of the whole world. Let's get it down into our souls. Oh! Friends, this world of outrage and alarm and anger that exists out there that we just eat up with a spoon it is killing you it's doing bad things to you it's not making you righteous and it's not making you wise it's stealing from you so get away from it i have deleted all those apps from my phone I still am on Facebook a little bit because of church stuff. But other than that, I am not on social media. I don't get any notifications on my phone from social media ever. And it has really been good for me, I got to say. Oh, next, I'm going to have to cut out like news programs because that whole righteous and anger thing, that happens big time. Um, for me there and it's become too important in my life I'll confess before you all well let's stop there James is really good so far we're not even done with the first chapter I, hopefully we'll finish it next time but remember next time Tuesday night next Tuesday night December or September so December wow September 5 7.30 I will be here. I hope you will be here too. Blessings. I love you. Have a great week. Let me pray for you. Father, help. Help us with temptation. Help us to recognize when we're being enticed and drawn away. Remind us that the good and the perfect gifts come from you. And Lord, most of all, this is my big prayer for myself and for my friends tonight. Teach me to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Teach me in the depths of my being that anger does not accomplish, human anger does not accomplish your righteousness. Help me with that one, Lord. I need it. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. Have a great week.